With the word of God in his hands, every human being, wherever his lot in life may be cast, may have such companionship as he shall choose. In its pages, he may hold converse with the noblest and best of the human race, and may listen to the voice of the Eternal as he speaks with men, as he studies and meditates upon the themes into which the angels desire to look, he may have their companionship. He may follow the steps of the heavenly teacher and listen to his voice as when he taught on mountain and plain and sea. He may dwell in this world in the atmosphere of heaven, imparting to earth's sorrowing and tempted ones thoughts of hope and longings for holiness, himself coming closer and still closer into fellowship with the unseen, like him of old who walked with God, drawing nearer and nearer the threshold of the eternal world until the portal shall open and he shall enter there. He will find himself no stranger. The voices that will greet him are the voices of the holy ones who unseen were on earth his companions. Voices that here he learned to distinguish and to love. He who through the word of God has lived in fellowship with heaven will find himself at home in heaven's companionship. Education, page 127, paragraph 1. God is good, and all the time. Good evening, everyone, and good evening to all God's people connecting via Facebook and YouTube. We're grateful for your presence, and we hope you've had a good day, whatever time of day it is in your part of the world. We thank God for sparing our lives and for extending to us this opportunity to listen to his word. We thank God for that. I had a pleasant day, and I'm deeply grateful to God for that. And so I say welcome, Karibuni, and I'm sure the Lord, through the agency of his spirit, will bless all those of us who listen with an honest mind and an honest heart. Is there anyone present who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hand? Is there anyone present? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? I'm sure... There are those listening who fit that description. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. We are pleased you have joined us, and I say that very, very sincerely. And may the Lord lavish his blessings upon you. And may you be so blessed that you will seek to worship with us this way again or in any other way that's available to you. I also ask God to bless every nation represented by those watching and bless all the leaders of those nations. Our subject for this evening, the lowest class. The lowest class. If you're using one of these, please make sure it does not ring. And so far, you've had a perfect record, and I pray that that will continue until we end on August 29. Second favor, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9 then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I truly want God to put his words in my mouth. Favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God made us intelligent. He gave us minds. Let's use them to reason as we listen to his life changing word let us pray our father and our god we thank you dear god for bringing us one more time to fellowship with you this way and to listen to the word we thank you god for sparing our lives for keeping us from harm and danger for giving your hands of protection over our families providing us with our needs dear god we're grateful our lives are not perfect we don't have everything we like but we're still grateful for your goodness. We particularly thank you for the blood of Christ. It is by this means you're able to forgive us now for whatever we may have done to offend you. Particularly forgive me as the one charged with this holy task of delivering the words of life. Cleanse me, dear Father, because I am weak. I am flesh, I am dirt. 
Speak through me, dear Father, so that surely the glory will come to you. I ask you to grant me your spirit in abundance that he may teach me what to say and let that same spirit enlighten the minds of those listening. Bless every country. Bless all the leaders. Particularly bless the host country of the United States. May the leaders seek your will in all that they do. Help them always to remember there's a God who's overseeing all the events on this earth for his purpose and for his glory. We commit this service to you now, Father. Take the glory and give us the blessing, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. There are some verses that are critical, very, very important. Genesis 2, 16, 17. Genesis 12, 1 to 3. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. These critical verses. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. I read from the King James Version of the Bible. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God told Adam, If you disobey me, the outcome will be death. Disobedience leads to death, unless repented of. Let me say that again. Disobedience to God leads eventually to death. And God said to Adam, In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. We know the serpent came along and tempted Eve. Let's go to chapter 3. We'll read verse 6. Our subject, the lowest class. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Let's examine what happened. Satan used an agent. The serpent. Are you with me? Having succeeded in getting Eve, Satan used another agent, this time Eve, to seduce her husband into sin. Let me say it differently. To put her husband's life at risk. Because God said, in the day Thou eatest, therefore thou shalt surely die. Whether she realized it or not, Eve endangered the life of her husband by serving as an agent of the devil. If that's clear, say amen. All right. Let's leave that sad story and go to another sad one. Genesis 19, we'll read from verse 30. Our subject the lowest class. Genesis 19, reading from verse 30. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain, for he feared to dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. Now, Lot is in the mountain and his two daughters with him. The Lord had told him originally, go to the mountains. He said, no, let me go to the city. God said, okay. When he reached the city, he decided God's recommendation was the best after all. And so he ended up going to the mountain where God told him to go in the first place. So Lot went out of Zoar and dwelt in a mountain and his two daughters with him. For he feared to dwell in Zoar and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. 31. And the firstborn said unto the younger. Now keep in mind, firstborn children exert tremendous influence among the other children in a family. Especially if you're a firstborn boy. The firstborn exert great influence over the rest of the children. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. We have no men with whom we can have children. Let us make our father drink wine. 
And we will lie with him that we may have seed, preserve seed of our father. So the older one said, come to the younger. Let's make our father drunk. We will sleep with him and have children with him. And they made their father drink wine. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. 34. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let me put that in different words. Behold, I sinned last night. Behold, I committed adultery last night. Behold, I violated honor thy father and thy mother last night. I did that last night. Come, let us make our father drink wine this again. And, we, and go thou in and lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. Now, young sister, go do what I did. In all societies, there are young boys heavily influenced by older brothers. There are young girls powerfully influenced by older sisters. Now, they may not say as boldly as Lot's daughter said, come, let us make our father drink wine. But just by their behavior, they are twisting or blessing the younger ones watching them. Let's leave the family and just go to the wider society. In any society in the neighborhood, there are little boys admiring the older boys who have cars or who have nice shoes or who have a lot of girlfriends. They say nothing. They just watch and they are affected powerfully. And so the... The, the older girl said, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Come, let us make him drink wine this let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. Thirty five, and they made the father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. The younger sister did it under pressure from the older sister. The older sister was an agent to lead the younger sister into sin. Eve was an agent to influence the decision of Adam to disobey God. Are you with me? Let's see how, well, let's look at another example, perhaps even sadder. Genesis 16, let's go back in Genesis. Genesis 16. We read from verse 1. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I will do what? Obtain children of her. Sarah tells her husband to have an affair with a woman in order that she might have a child attributed to her. And the Bible says, very sadly, and Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. A wife inducing her husband to commit a sin that caused problems for the rest of Abram's life or Abraham's life. And so we have Eve seducing her husband into sin. We have the eldest daughter of Lot encouraging the younger one into sin. We have Sarai, is what she was called then, encouraging her husband to sin. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Our subject, the lowest class. Matthew 5, we'll read from verse 17. 7.15 on the dot, I'll release you before 8. <clears throat> Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. This is Jesus speaking. The one who died for us. The one whom we love. The one whom we trust. These are his words. Think not 
that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'll pause on that. There are some things you and I should not even think about. Far less do them. Because behavior begins in the heart or in the mind. You think about it, then you do it. And the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Jesus said, don't even think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill, to make it complete, to show you what it really is, to live it out fully in my life. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Till heaven and earth pass. Christ is saying heaven and earth will cease to exist first before one atom of the law ceases to exist. And we know that there will always be heaven and an earth. Isaiah 66, 22, For as the new heaven and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord. It will always remain. I'll change it from the old to the new. It will always remain, the Bible says. And so Jesus says, For till heaven and earth pass, and they'll never pass. We'll go from old to new. One jot or one tittle. The little dot over the eye, the little strike over the T, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now listen to verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. What's our subject? The lowest class. Listen carefully to the words of Jesus, not my words. Jesus says, people in heaven, the heavenly inhabitants look down. And as they observe people encouraging others to break God's law, they regard them as the lowest on the earth. Every country has a class system. Are you with me? You have the low class, you have the not so low class, you have the lower middle class, you have the middle class, you have the upper middle class, you have the rich, you have the wealthy, then you have the super rich, then you have the elite. <laughs> with all due respect, I understand there are so many castes in India, from the Brahmin down to the untouchable. Those who encourage others to violate the law of God. Those who preach there is no law. They are regarded by the inhabitants of heaven as the least of all those on the face of the earth. Because when you do that, you are threatening the life of the person who may follow your leading. And so Jesus says... <clears throat> Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. You look at all ten, you can decide which is the least. And shall teach people to do that. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. The verse goes on. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called what? Great in the kingdom of heaven. We have the lowest to the highest. And we're dealing tonight with the lowest. Because despite the clear wording of the Bible, there are those who still say there is no law. And the Bible says those who do that are regarded by heavenly beings as the least in the kingdom of heaven. Not that they get to the kingdom, but those in the kingdom look at them as the least. Go to Matthew 18. Let's try to emphasize that point also with words from Jesus Christ. Matthew 18. Let's read from verse 1. Our subject, the lowest class. Then we will go back to Matthew 5. Let me pray again. Holy Father in heaven, help me to speak with boldness, but with compassion, for I too am a sinner. 
tell me what to say, how to say it, and when to say it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Matthew 18, reading from verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall, in, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one of these little ones in my name receiveth me. Now look at verse 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now the word offend means to cause to stumble. And to some degree, we, we're all guilty of that. To some degree, we have misled someone either directly or simply by our influence and we ask God to forgive us for that. Jesus, the loving Jesus, who hurt no one when he was on this earth, who took abuse, never gave abuse. He said, anyone that causes someone to stumble, harms the person's faith in him, it were better for that person that a millstone, that's a heavy stone, were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Which means, if you have no desire, no intention to obey God's law, don't try to get others in your camp of disobedience. I've often said, we'll always say it, and I say it to me before I say it to you, if you have to sin, or if you have to go to hell, go alone. If you're determined to make it into God's kingdom, take someone with you. Can you say amen? If you want to go to hell, go alone. If you desire a place in God's kingdom, take someone with you. And so Jesus says, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me. When you tell someone not to obey God's law, you are causing that person to stumble. It were better for you that a millstone were hanged about your neck, says Jesus, and that you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Why would Jesus say that? Because to, to direct someone towards destruction is a crime of the highest magnitude. The law of God is to be kept by the power of God. The law of God is the standard of righteousness. The law of God is the way we should walk. And to tell someone walk another way is to endanger that person's life. Let's go back to Matthew 5 and look at the other side of that. Matthew 5, we read 19 and 20. Our subject, the lowest class. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do, in other words, obey God's law and teach others to do that, whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now listen to verse 20. Why well, say unto you, accept your righteousness. Shall what? What's the next word? Exceed, if you have the King James. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Listen to Christ again. Except your righteousness shall exceed, rise above. The righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus proceeds to give us examples of righteousness that exceeds. Because someone can say to him, well, what do you mean? My righteousness must exceed. How does that happen? Look at verse 21. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother, 
without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Stop. Listen again to what Jesus says in verse 20. Except your righteousness shall exceed. The, the scribes and Pharisees had a righteousness that they were proud of. <laughs> Called self-righteousness, which does not impress God. Jesus said, you as a child of mine must exceed. Which means, by the way, God expects more of his children than he does of the world. You missed what I said. God expects more from you than he does from those who don't claim to know him. And so Jesus said, your righteousness must exceed. Then he gives them an example of righteousness exceeding. And he says, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Now the Pharisees understood that to mean, don't cut someone's head off. Don't shoot someone. Don't poison someone. Don't run someone over with a chariot. Hmm? Don't physically kill. That's how they saw it. That was their level of righteousness. Here is the righteousness that exceeds, but I say unto you, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Jesus takes that commandment, thou shalt not kill, to a height and a depth the Pharisees had no clue about. They were thinking no physical killing. Jesus is going way beyond that. Resentment against your brother. Anger with no righteous motive is classified in the eyes of God as murder. Jesus says, that's the level of righteousness I require of you. But where does he go to get an example of righteousness that exceeds? He goes to the law. Because commandment 6 says what? Thou shalt not kill. If the law had been done away in the days of Christ, he couldn't do that. Verse 27, ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not commit adultery. For the Pharisees, it meant no physical interaction. Jesus said, but I say unto you, that whoso ever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now this is a higher level of righteousness. The commandment seven, thou shalt not commit adultery, affects the way we think. Sure, by lusting you don't get a, a sexually transmitted disease. You can't make someone pregnant by just lusting. We know that. But in the eyes of God, it is still adultery. That's a higher level of righteousness. And where does Christ go for that example? To the law. What am I saying then? What is Christ saying? The righteousness that saves is the same righteousness found in the law of God. Yes, it is Christ that saves us. But the very righteousness that Christ covers us is also found in the law of God. Go to Romans chapter 8. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject, the lowest class. Romans 8, reading from verse 1. I hope someone has said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I really need that spiritual support. At no time does a preacher feel weaker than when he's actually preaching. You have Romans 8, reading from verse 1. I'll pray again. Dear God in heaven, take full control of me and all my faculties. Dear God, speak through me as you spoke on Mount Sinai. In Jesus' name, amen. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his only Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Now listen carefully. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us 
One of the reasons Christ came was to demonstrate that the righteousness expressed in the law can be expressed in us. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and forcing condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Which means the exceeding righteousness Christ talks about in Matthew 5 is required of us through Christ. The lowest class. Those who minimize the law of God are regarded by heavenly beings from the father down to the lowest angel as the least. Those who encourage others to obey God are regarded by heavenly inhabitants as great. My question for you tonight, don't answer me, wherever you are. Based on how you interact with others and what you say about God's law, does heaven see you as least or great? Let me show you something else about what people miss when they're distracted from the law of God as a standard of living. Go to John 14. It's exactly 7.30. John 14. We'll read 15, then we go to 21, and read to 23. John 15, 14, sorry. We'll read verse 15, which I know you know without looking. Then we'll skip to 21. Jesus said, If ye love me, finish it for me, keep my commandments. This is the only way to show love for God. Let me say it again. This is the only way in the Bible to show love for God. If you love me, keep my commandments. If the commandments are no longer necessary, how do we love God? Go to 1 John. Chapter 2, then we'll come back to John 14. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. We read verse 4. First John chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says, First John is towards the back of the Bible. Hope you found it by now. We read, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, finish the verse, is a liar. Let me tell you again, this book, 1 John, was written about 60 years after Jesus went back to heaven. This is written by the disciple who was closest to Christ. This was the disciple to whom Christ entrusted his mother when Christ was on the cross. John 19, 26, 27. He said, son, behold thy mother, mother, behold thy son. Jesus felt very special about John. He gave his mother to John. John loved him. John was closest to him. John reflected the character of Jesus more than any other disciple as he grew. Now, this disciple, he says... He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. Everybody loves Jesus. Nobody obeys him. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. How people dance around that verse, I will never understand. But when it is not in the heart to obey God, people find all kinds of explanations to get around God's plainly spoken word. Let's go back now to John 14. We'll read 15, then we'll skip to 21. Our subject, the lowest class, 25 minutes to 8. And you don't have to wait until the end of the message to make a decision. The Holy Ghost can convict you during the message to make a decision to obey God. You do not have to wait until I'm done. You can be convicted five minutes after I begin. Then you fill out that card. 
Say, Father, I want to obey you. I want to be baptized. I need a visit if you're in this area. John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Stop. How do you identify someone who truly loves God? Tell me. The person who obeys the commandments. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Listen again. He that hath my commandments, everybody has them in the Bible, and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. Clearly, there is a level of love only available to those who obey God. We know from John 3.16, for God so loved the world. God has a general love for the world. And it's very genuine. But for those who obey, they enter into a deeper love relationship with God because of heartfelt obedience. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. The condition for that is obedience. 22. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Unto us and not unto the world. Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me. He will keep my words. Words means commandments. And my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. The obedient is the one who enjoys a closer relationship with God. Not my words. The words of the Bible. My father and I will come and dwell in their own mysterious way in the person who from the heart obeys God. Satan knows that. And so he gets into people to tell other people, don't obey God. Because disobedience distances you from God. Not that he doesn't love you, but Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tell us, sin has separated between you and your God. Iniquity and sin has caused him, have caused him to hide his face from us. The opposite of sin is righteousness with his obedience. My brothers and sisters, the Bible is a very simple book to understand. The only way to love God is to obey him. Listen to the second commandment. Let's go to uh, Exodus 20, reading from verse 4. Our subject, the lowest class. Exodus 20, reading from verse 4. Second book of the Bible, Exodus 20, reading from verse 4. Our subject, the lowest class. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Keep this in mind. And shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Here again we have in the Ten Commandments itself we're told the way to love God is to keep his commandments. And the way to hate God is to disobey his commandments regardless of what comes out of the mouth. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. But we don't know yet how we hate God. That's left hanging. But by reasoning, we can answer that question. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments than those who hate me are those who don't. As simple as night and day. God's commandments, 
was spoken from Sinai by Jesus himself. I say again, the Ten Commandments were spoken on Mount Sinai by Jesus himself. Why? Because when Adam sinned, God ceased all direct communication with man. Everything now went through Jesus. Jesus said, no man can come to the Father but by me. The Father was on the mountain with his son, yes. But it was Jesus speaking for the Father. It was the voice of the Redeemer that said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It was the voice of Jesus that said, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my command. Go to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah 1, we'll read verses 4 and 5. Read 4 and 5, Nehemiah got some bad news about the condition of Jerusalem. The news was brought to him by his cousin Hanani, mentioned in verse 2. And it came to pass that when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, verse 5, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that do what? Love him and observe his commandments. Here again we're told, that's how you love God. You observe his commandments. The Bible has several other passages that say the same thing. Now, the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Matthew 18, 